Hi, everybody, and welcome to Story Stop Bookish Road Trip. We'll get ready to go in 30 seconds. Hi everyone, I am Chris Spizak. I am author of the Family Story Workbook. And we're here tonight because sometimes we get sucked into our lives. We are living our day to day, we are going to work, we are setting our alarm clock, we are trying to pay the bills, and we don't always pause to reflect on the moments we are living, on the moments that have created us to be who we are, and the past that has shaped us, even the past and generations before we have even come into the picture. Tonight, I am here with, excuse me, four wonderful authors that I'm super excited to introduce you to. But first, as we're just getting started, I have a question for everybody. If you are here with us, have you ever wanted to write your life story? Have you ever wanted to capture the story of a parent, of a grandparent? Have you ever wanted to remember that moment when you were a kid, when you were a teenager, and that has shaped you in some way? And of course, if you're watching us live on Facebook or Twitter or Periscope or wherever you happen to are, feel free to add it into the comments. We'll throw it up onto the screen. But whoever you are, no matter where you're coming from, my biggest belief is that every single one of us has a story. We might not all be in the history books but every single one of us shapes this world that we are living in. And this is the origin of my latest book. And this is the origin of our story stop tour this evening. Okay, so about a year ago, uh, or a couple years ago, I was stumbling through some photographs and I ended up getting a picture of someone who would be my great grandfather, someone I didn't met, meet but he was kneeling next to a bunch of freshly painted beehives in Ukraine before World War II. And I found myself having so many questions. Who was this man? I know the little stories, but who is this person? What was his life like day to day? How was he shaped into the person who shaped the generations to come? We all have these questions. But the thing is, I'm a writer, I'm an author, I'm an editor who works with people's stories, but we all have those stories. We don't have to be writers to be storytellers. Now, to tell some stories today, to dive in a little bit and give you a little bit of the behind the scenes look of their own lives, their own stories, I have four authors I would like to introduce you to here today. And of course, feel free to share this as you're coming. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hi. Hello. So what we're going to do just as we are getting started, I would love to kind of go through really quickly and introduce everyone. If you could just say your name and tell us who are you, what are you writing, what are you working on? And again, I am just so thrilled that the four of you are here with me tonight. Let's just go in the order that we happen to be on the screen. Melissa. Hi, I am Melissa Face. I am a mom of two. I am a teacher and I am a writer. Stories, oh my goodness, I love to write them. I love to tell them. I don't mean lies though, I mean actually telling stories. <laughs> and I love to hear them. I mean, they are a fundamental part of my life. Absolutely, absolutely. So happy to be here. Thanks, Melissa. Mary. And I think you're on mute. Hi, <laughs> my name is Mary Helen Sheriff. I am the author of Boop and Eve's Road Trip. Um, I live in outside of Richmond, Virginia, and I have two kids, two cats, and only one husband. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So far. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Oh, um, my name is Libby McNamee, and I am a writer. I'm a lawyer. I am former military officer. I've had more lives than a cat. Um, <laughs> I have written, um, let's see, my book is right here, uh, Susanna's Midnight Ride. And I am finishing up edits on a second book called Dolly Madison and the War of 1812. So I love stories too. I love reading them. I love to read. That's my passion. And um, my husband always says, oh, mom has a good book. The house is really quiet. <laughs> and then my mom is good mood, he's like, are you not reading something good right now? Um, so I love to read and I love hearing other people's stories and telling stories. And that to me is what life is all about is the funny things that happen along the way. So Absolutely. Julie, I think you're next. Julie. Okay. Uh, my name is Julie Valerie. It's great to be here, everybody. Um, I am also married to one person, but I have two daughters, <laughs> two sons, two dogs. Um, both of them are Labradors, one yellow, one chocolate. I have two books. <laughs> um, the um, Holly Banks Full of Banks, which is book one in the Village of Prim series, and followed by The Peculiar Fate of Holly Banks, book two in the Village of Prim series. And uh, they both just came out in the last year. And I love stories because I think it's the thread that connects us um, to each other. And without them, I couldn't imagine the world, whether the stories are written, whether they're told um, from the campfire from long ago to you know, sitting in the family rooms during COVID. I, without stories, I think that we would lose an essential part of our humanity. Absolutely. That's really nice so to be well said. That's so well said. And I feel like, especially striking this mm -hmm. moment that we're living through right now. Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can just ponder for a moment that first time you were wearing a mask in public, thinking about just looking around you and seeing other people in masks in public. And I think that's the origin of the Story Stop Tour that's been kind of virtually traveling the country for the past couple of months. We're living through stories right now. We're living through history and we need to write it down so we don't forget that moment where you walked down the toilet paper aisle and it was empty. All are shaping us. Now, again, I'm just thrilled y'all are here with me tonight. And I'm excited to kind of go behind the scenes into your lives and the stories that have inspired you. So we're going to kind of go one by one here. And I was wondering, Melissa, if you could kind of kick us off. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about who is the best storyteller in your family? Maybe what's a great story they've told? What is it about the way they tell their stories? Um, take it wherever you would like to go. Sure. Well, I think I need to start first by saying that I am also only married to one husband. I feel like if I don't say that right now, that people are going to be assuming that I'm the one who's not. So, <laughs> yes, one husband, two children, but many, many jobs and lots of stories. And I didn't even show you all my my book cover a minute ago, so let me do that. Um, I Love You More Than Coffee is my essay collection. It came out September 1st, so she's almost six months old, and it is such a fun journey. But now I will um, definitely get on point and talk to you about a storyteller. This is a neat one for me. Um, the man that I have been told was the best storyteller in my family passed away when I was five. So oftentimes what I think I have that are memories of him, I really have memories of the stories that I've been told, if that makes sense, throughout the years. And my grandfather, Papa, was a truck driver. Um, he would drive cross country. He would drive up and down the coast, Maine to Florida, um, carrying all sorts of loads from seafood to grapefruits. Really, really cool job, really interesting life, um, lots of ups and downs. And he was a larger than life character, more so than anyone really that I've ever read about. And I love the stories that I have of him and that I hear of him. And I'm one of those who is always digging for more. I'm always asking my parents questions. When my grandmother was alive, I asked her questions about him and just trying to piece together what I could of his life and find some connections. And some of the stories that 
I have of him that I have recently written about were just incidents that I've put together, like him witnessing a man's car engine catch fire. And his first reaction was to grab an onlooker's Coke and put the fire out with this man's drink who got hopping mad at him, of course. And there was nearly a fist fight. Um, my grandfather wasn't a stranger to conflict. He was one of those who, um, and this may have been his quotes originally, who could cuss you up one side and down the other. You heard that expression before? I love it. That's something, right? And um, he could also, another cliche, give you the shirt off his back. So just a really, really amazing person that is still unbelievable to me in so many ways because I just never knew him the way I'd like to. And my grandmother would always say, like, don't you remember that? Don't you remember that? And recently I had the opportunity to honor him. I wrote a piece called Connected about um, my similarities, similarities to him in terms of personality, a um, little bit of a temper, maybe a little bit, um, occasional potty mouth, but <laughs> what can you do when it's genetic? What can you do? Right. And um, this story appeared in a new lit mag out of New Mexico called the Pearl River Quarterly. And it's the first time actually that I've ever written about him because it was a challenge to feel like I had enough to say that I knew was true and to create what I wanted to around it. And I was able to include a picture of him and I don't know, is that working? Yep. Yeah. Of him and a little me and yeah. we are churning ice cream, the um, hand crank style, making ice cream together. And another story that I wrote about in this particular piece, he and my mom and her siblings and my grandmother, and I believe a cousin was along as well, took a trip to New York. And they were at the top of the Empire State Building and a man tried to, well, he was trying to jump off and my grandfather tried to save him, coax him down, and he was unsuccessful. Oh, and the man ended up losing his life. And of course, my family devastated after what they thought was gonna be a great trip. So I grew up hearing all of these stories and I'm sure there are so many more and I hope to to keep digging because like I think Julie mentioned a minute ago, like they they are threads. They're they're wonderful. And in some cases they're they're all we have. It's absolutely true. It's absolutely true. And I think that's kind of that thread that's always been inside of me as well is sometimes you just hear these little stories at the dinner table when you're growing up or at bedtime or whenever it is. And then you suddenly have this moment of realizing we need to write this stuff down. We need to preserve it. We need to pull out a tape recorder, whatever it is. And that's really the origin of where this book is, that this is not a book for reading. This is a book for a whole lot of fill in the blank questions, prompts, ideas to sit and ask around the dinner table of, well, do you remember that time that this happened? And then it's so funny to hear that moment in New York, Melissa, everyone's different perspective who was there kind of has extra details in the story, extra yeah. version of that story. And all of that is just so fascinating to capture. Melissa, how cool is it to have somebody in your life like that? That's great that you got to capture him in one of your latest stories. Congratulations. Your stories have been taking off. I feel like every time I turn around, mm -hmm. you have something else out there. Chicken soup for the soul. Just all this stuff is happening for you lately. So thank you. Anyways, I'm enjoying it. It's a lot of fun. Thank you so much for sharing some of that with us. Sure. And I know sometimes we have moments in our lives that kind of jump into our writing as authors. Julie, I was wondering if I could kind of tap you on this one. Has there been anything about your life that has jumped into your writing? Yeah, I would say um, being a mother of four, I've got a big piece of hair sticking up, but I'm going to roll with it. Being a mother of four, you know, I never in my life have I ever um, wanted to do something, um, you know, 
do it the right way, you know, be a good mom and, and do my best to raising these four kids. But also never have I experienced so much sabotage inside of one day. You know, you go to the grocery store because you're out of out of groceries and you just need to get a bunch of stuff. And, and especially with four kids, I would have the baby number four, you know, like in the seat and then number three in the basket. And then I'd have a cart behind me that I'd put the groceries in and then the two girls would be walking beside me and they'd get tired and someone would knock something off a shelf, someone would be screaming, the baby would soil the diaper, you know, just trying to get basics, um, grocery store things. And then of course they tell you um, when your kids misbehave, you're supposed to leave the store right away. But I've always thought no, because then they win and they'll 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 misbehave wherever <laughs> we go and I'll never get any groceries done. And so there have been times when I when I throughout my, my motherhood that I wanted to do a really great job and I kind of set myself up um, to fail miserably, especially because sometimes I think that the four kids were working against me and sometimes a day just went completely crazy. There was one time when I was going to take the two youngest out to the mall to buy a Father's Day gift and I realized that they're both buckled in the car seats. I'm on the driveway, a car's running and I realized, oh, I forgot the sippy cup. It's on the kitchen counter, which was like through the garage, through the door, like it felt like it was so close and they were buckled in and they were, you know, everything was fine. So I ran inside really quick to grab the sippy cups and then I ran back out and I do, cannot explain how this happened in the same amount of time. But apparently the youngest knew how to unbuckle his car seat, which is something he continued to do for about a year and a half. And we had to, um, I pulled into a fire station one time to like, to have a fireman come out and explain to him, you got to stay in your car seat. That's a whole nother story. But um, he got out of his car seat. He climbed into the driver's seat. He put the car into drive and he rolled forward down my driveway to a can of paint that my husband had put out because it was the one day of the year that you could take paint to the recycling center and they would, you know, dispose of it in a safe manner. And he, and he, picked the car went up and on top of the paint cans and I come running out with the sippy cups and I've got a my youngest of four in he's like two or three at the time maybe four but I really think he was around two or three um and he's in the driver's seat the car is actively running I've got another child in the car and they are now perched to up on top of a bunch of paint cans that oh I don't Yes. And so moments like that, when I'm trying to like be the best mom I can, I think to myself, why didn't I kill the engine, you know, put it in a park, take the keys with me when I was just trying to go like right there. And I didn't know that he could even unbuckle. And so it's amazing how quickly kids can completely turn your life around, how your moments from chaos and sabotage and crazy things happening. And so the whole wild experience of trying to be a good mom with four kids that I think were like out to get me from the start um, made me want to write stories about, you know, a similar kind of experience. I'm not Holly. These are not based on my actual real life. These are, this is fiction. Um, but I started to realize that I wasn't alone um, and that there were many moms out there trying their best and that something like forgetting your child's lunch could make you feel really bad. I know if somebody close to me forgot their child's 100th day of school project. And when she realized that her daughter was going to be sitting at circle time and that all of the kids would be showing what their 100 toothpicks were and their 100 pennies and their 100 um, collection is that her daughter would be sitting there without her 100 item thing because her mom had forgotten this is like a first grader so she, her her mom in part had forgotten to send her to school with her 100 project thing that they had been working on for a really long time and it can make you feel horrible inside when those things happen in motherhood and then sometimes you think to yourself okay you know i need to put things in perspective this is this is just my child's 100th day project like she will survive we will survive everything is fine this is you know in the, in the grand scheme of things out there this you know i have to set this i have to you know figure out that and and appreciate the fact that this really isn't a dire emergency but you know what it kind of is it is kind of devastating. You do feel really, really bad when something simple like that, you forgot because things were chaotic and you think you start imagining what the experience was like for your first grader. So, you know, there's there's things like that in parenthood all day, every day. 
Um, and so I set out to write some stories that would hopefully lift the spirits of somebody that might have just had a really bad day. And I think that storytelling inside of motherhood, sometimes it, it usually has a lot of heart because you, you love your children. And I say motherhood, but I also mean parenthood, um, fathers as well. But you, you, the stakes are high. You desperately love your children. You want things to go well. And when they don't go well, sometimes somebody it just happens to be wearing a Superman suit or they're dressed as Cinderella or like weird things. And you have to try to explain why this catastrophic thing happens. And sometimes they are genuinely catastrophic. Um, sometimes you find your child in a car on top of a bunch of paint cans. Um, other times it's a school project. Um, so sometimes they're devastating. Sometimes they're funny. Sometimes they're really strange. You think to yourself, I would have never been in this situation if I didn't have a bunch of little people all around me all day long and all of the things that they have to do in their lives. So yeah, the stories that I shared with other mothers always helped me to feel better. You know, just as I was feeling rotten that I just horribly messed something up, it was always the story of another mom saying, oh my gosh, guess what I did or this happened. And so it was trading stories and sharing stories with others that made me feel better, that allowed me to laugh after the fact, um, to forgive myself when I was hard on myself for having screwed something up. And so I think through stories, I formed camaraderies, or I can't pronounce that word. I formed a camaraderie. Mm -hmm. I for some reason, it doesn't feel like that word is coming out the right way. I formed a bond with other women and came to go a little bit easier on myself and forgive myself and not be so hard on myself and learn to, to relax a little bit and see the humor in all of the craziness of, of parenthood. I absolutely love that. And through the craziness of living it, of connecting with others through these stories and then actually putting it on the page to your brilliant, hilarious, fun, <laughs> inspiring books. I mean, it all comes full circle. Mm -hmm. um, that's wonderful. Thank you very Thank much, you. Julie, for sharing a little bit about that. Uh, Mary, I was wondering if we could turn to you next and what perhaps has happened in your life that has inspired some of your writing. Sure. So my novel, which was, um, well, it's at the bottom. <laughs> we have an easy road trip. Um, is the story is also fictional, um, but it does play on some real life events and um, a real life person. In fact, um, Boop is is inspired by my grandmother, um, who we called Hootie. So you can kind of hear the ooh sound uh, resonating. Um, and so you know, I took some of the quirks of my grandmother's personality and things like that and put them into Boop. For example, my grandmother collected birdhouses. And so Boop collects birdhouses and they drive the same car and, and things like that. Um, but the story I wanted to share with you that is based on real life, but is fictionalized in the book um, is a story from when I was 23. Um, and I was traveling, oh, I was living in Germany. I was doing my student teaching um, on an American army base and having the absolute time of my life. We um, would teach all day and then in the evenings we would meet at an Irish pub in town and it was like expat central and we made tons of friends and it kind of always reminded me of like the show Cheers, if you guys remember that. Mm -hmm. um, but I had this friend that was with me and she had this amazing ability to attract men. <laughs> we were sitting there and inevitably somebody would come up and start talking to her. And I was just flabbergasted and jealous of this amazing <laughs> ability. And and we actually traveled a lot on the weekends and stuff too. It happened in all the countries we went to. It was like, it was phenomenal. And so I said, I don't understand how you're doing this. Like what? Anyway, it turned out she had a system on how to flirt and how to get men to come and approach you. And it involved um, eye contact and how long you held the eye contact and whether or not you smiled and when you would toast your glass to the guy and this whole thing. And so she explained her system to me and I tell you what, I tried it and it worked. Like every <laughs> single time I did it, it worked. So I tell you this because in the novel, Boop and Eve, and Boop is, you know, a 80 year old woman and Eve is her um, 19 year old granddaughter are on their road trip. And Boop is concerned that Eve does not seem to be um, 
having boyfriends and things like that. And so Boop decides to give her flirting lessons. And so I transferred the flirting lessons I got in Germany to Boop giving to her granddaughter because I just thought that would be really funny if an 80 year old <laughs> is teaching her granddaughter how to pick up a guy in a bar. And so that's just kind of like a fun way that I was able to take a real life story and fictionalize it into my novel. I absolutely love that. That's wonderful. That's funny. The very specific methodology here. I swear it worked. It was it was amazing. So if you want to learn how to do it, you can read the book and <laughs> try it out because 100%. Wow. I absolutely adore it. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Mary. Okay. And we're going to flip last to Libby. Different right. style of book. We're going to historical fiction now. Now, how has a moment in your life influenced something of a completely different time period, different moment in history? Well, I had done a lot of different writing. I had done um, essays. I'd had different um, columns in different Richmond papers and magazines. I had a travel column. I had a humor column with you know personal things. And um, I really enjoyed that. And I was working on fiction, but I just couldn't find something that really resonated. I'd start something and I just couldn't figure out what I wanted, what really felt like my passion. I felt like more like I was just trying to come up with something. And I had written one kind of chiclet story like a long time ago, but I didn't want to continue in that genre. And um, this is an amazing story. When I first moved to Richmond, I didn't know anyone. I actually knew one person in Richmond and I got an apartment on the boulevard. And um, when I was opening the door, trying to get in, the door wouldn't open. And this little girl came out of the um, apartment on the first floor and she was about two years old and she opened the door for me. So we became great friends and I became great friends with her parents and um, absolutely loved them. And when I got married, she was a flower girl in our wedding. And when she was 14, she passed away, unfortunately. And she had one of those um, ir irregularities in her heart that were not mm -hmm. detectable, you know, congenital heart defect. Mm -hmm. So she was training for cross country and just collapsed and they couldn't revive her. So I was at her funeral and I had met her uncle for the first time and we were talking about what a wonderful girl, her name was Joy. I mean, she just was the most wonderful girl. And um, we were talking about how she had such a gift for bringing people together. And we looked around the gymnasium and there were just people swirled around all the way through the gym, waiting in line to go into the next room, to, you know, because basically they were holding the wake there to go see the parents. And um, so he started telling me, he said, oh, I heard you're a writer. Well, um, I've got this story for you. Someone's really gonna write this. I think you should write this. And he told me about Susanna Bowling. And, um, and I said, well, I, you know, I just was very skeptical. Like, I'm from Massachusetts. We talk about Paul Revere a lot. Like, why have I not heard about the Susanna Bowling person? I really don't believe that this actually happened because why isn't it in the history books? And so he gave me a couple places to kind of start looking. And I started to look into it more to just prove it wrong and be able to say, well, there was nothing there. And then I realized, oh my gosh, this is true. And there is a story here. So it was really kind of an amazing thing of really, if, if Joy hadn't passed away, I never would have met her uncle. I never would have heard that he never would have told me that story, which led, which really changed my life a lot. And so it's kind of a neat legacy of joy too. So that was the last person I listed in my, um, you know, acknowledgements at the uh -huh. end was joy to, to thank her for bringing me together with Greg and learning the story. So that's what I love about life is just these little things that happen that they change the whole direction your life goes in. Mm -hmm. And at the time you don't realize it's a big deal, but then you look back and you think, my gosh, that was absolutely pivotal that that happened. So it's kind of a neat um, thing where I feel like Joy has got a legacy there that she's yes. kind of tied in with this. Um, of course, I'd rather, I'd rather that she was still around, but, um, but it's neat to feel that she was kind of part of that. And then I realized this is my passion and I love this. And, um, and then I love, realizing with history is realizing 
to me, it's not all these dates and places and events, it's people and just learning all these quirky stories about people and finding these little nuggets of information. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, this is such a great factoid. I have to figure out a way to fit it into the story because right, right. it's you know such an amazing little tidbit that I found. So, um, so that's what, and that's why I like writing the age group I do because I love showing kids that History is about stories about quirky people and these people that we think of, even our founding fathers, they had plenty of faults and a lot of them didn't like each other and they didn't get along and a lot of them were wrong what they were saying. And um, so I feel like it gives me hope that the times were very imperfect back then and it's okay that things are imperfect now and we'll get through it. But um, but I, I'd love to inspire kids to learn about history at a young age, because I really wish I had discovered that I had this intense interest when I was a lot younger, instead of basically finding it in my 40s, really. So. Right, right, and you're absolutely true. Just this whole concept of history is stories. It's history mm -hmm. of living people, just like we're living today. Um, it's fun to kind of see the comments rolling in here about people loving stories from about your grandfather, Melissa. Um, another comments on uh, loving that scene where Boop teaches <laughs> flirts, um, grading, hearing the stories that shaped your book, Mary, and all of these. Um, it's absolutely wonderful. Now, one thing, especially for the audience listening, do you think you have to be a great writer to be a storyteller? Do you need an instrument in your hand, whether it's a pen or a pencil or a keyboard, or is storytelling something else? I was wondering, do any of y'all have a comment on that? You're all nodding. Um, <laughs> really, I've heard this to you. What do you think? Uh, me? Yeah, I, I, I think that um, a writing instrument helps, but that you don't you do not need to have a writing instrument. There's many ways to tell a story. Mm -hmm. So you could tell it around a campfire. You can tell it with a with a wink, um, like to Mary's um, Mary's story about how to flirt from across the bar. You know, her friend was telling a story um, mm -hmm. to a man across the bar. Come, come, talk to me. So all of it was just you know from across the room. You could signal to somebody and communicate with them. Um, I know that just, you know, with nature, hiking the Appalachian Trail, you know, the 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 squirrels are telling a story and the the, the the sway of the trees is telling a story of the coming weather and the wind and storms. And, um, you know, there's there's if you've traveled internationally and you've ever been around somebody that didn't speak your language, you can quickly tell how, you know, that you can communicate even if you're if your native tongue is not the same. So I think that there is many different forms of storytelling. Art, go to a museum and see some a beautiful painting or a sculpture can, can move you deeply. Um, and so I think that the, through a visual object um, can also tell a very captivating story. Absolutely. Have any of y'all been diary keepers in your life? Melissa, you look your yeah. like. <laughs> yes. Oh my goodness. And then going oh God, back to Instagram feed it. it. I'm sorry, say that again. Your Instagram feed alone with just little quotes from your daily life. I love yes. it. <laughs> well, when I think diary, I think my teenage years, you know, does it conjure up that image for you mm -hmm. all? Like your diary, I think mad at my parents, dating my boyfriend, sitting on my bed, writing in my diary, right? Going back and looking at those now is such a treat. <laughs> wow, Melissa's 16 year old thoughts but um, journaling still, yes. And I'm about to embark on a new venture and I'm, I'm saying it here for the first time. I bought a copy of The Artist's Way. Mm. I'm saying yeah. the right title. Okay. So I'm gonna start morning pages soon. So daily writing first thing. I've never done that. I've never committed to the every single day approach, so. Yeah. So and I want to comment on one other thing real quick, if I have a second to do so. Absolutely. You had asked if you had to be a writer to be a storyteller. And the one thing that I wanted to say about that is that don't be so quick to dismiss yourself as a writer. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really, really big mm -hmm. thing too, that we're always waiting, a lot of us are waiting for something 
before we can call ourselves that. And I'd hate to see other people wait until they're 40, like I did, to feel like I could really tell people I was a writer. Mm -hmm. I've been a writer all my life. And I felt for the longest time that it wasn't okay to say because I hadn't done this or I hadn't done that. And I think, yes, storytellers and writers were were those things when when we want to be, when we want to tell a story, when we want to write, we can claim the title. Absolutely. And everybody has those stories and everybody has the ability, ability to write it down. Even as someone who has written a book about grammar, um, <laughs> not always about the grammar. And we don't need to be intimidated about those red pens from middle school that just hover in the back of our brains. And it's okay. And mistakes happen and the grammar police are not going to get you. Sometimes it's just writing it down. And Melissa, I'm so happy that you said that because you're right. We can all be storytellers. We can all be writers without being scared of that word. It does not mean that you have a New York Times bestselling book <laughs> deal. Writers, it's not a scary thing. I love that you said that. Absolutely. Now, do you think it's important for folks to really capture and tell the stories of their family? What does that mean for your family specifically is passing on those stories? Anyone? I, so I, we have some, I'm sorry, go ahead, Julie. No, Libby, go ahead, because I, I spoke oh, okay. on the last. No, I um, I have all these notes from when my son was little, you know, all the funny little things. And we tell him all the stories. Like, it just even yesterday, we were going through all these stories about when he was, you know, old enough, he'd be in his crib and he'd say into the, into the you know, the uh, monitor, he'd be like, I want to wake up, like a little vampire. And, you know, it was hilarious. And then he got a little older and he'd say, will someone get me out of here? And, <laughs> Okay, maybe he needs to get out of the crib. Um, but it's just stuff like that. And I would just write it down on a little sleep piece of paper. And I'm so glad I did because I come across them and it just totally cracks me up. Because what I've also realized too is you think your day is boring or you think, oh, you know, my kid, my little boy has this little high, sweet little voice. And it's like, someday his voice is going to change. Mm -hmm. And it really is special. But day in and day out, you think, like, my son always wore a fire hat. He would even sleep with a fire hat. So if you came in at three in the morning because he was screaming, he would have, he'd be sitting there with the fire hat on. <laughs> and my husband used to think he was going to grow mold on his head because he was, like, always sweaty under there. He had it on in the bathtub. Like, oh, my gosh. Like, his, his little... Um, you know, CCD teacher was like, I don't think I'd recognize him without that fire hat on. <laughs> but, um, you know, but one day the fire hat went away and now I wish that we had taken more pictures, but I just always thought the fire hat was gonna be there. I mean, we and there were like five fire hats, you know? So, um, but yeah, it's funny the things that in your day in and day out that you just think, oh, well, that's not that exciting because it's so familiar to you, but to somebody else, it's absolutely hilarious. Mm -hmm. and, and, and now um, this is kind of a neat story thing is my son is in high school and he's doing this thing where they he's interviewing me about my trip to Bosnia when I was in the army. I went for six months. So he's interviewing me and videotaping it and he's submitting it to the Library of Congress with pictures and all that kind of stuff. And he's you know drawing up all these interview questions. And, and I have all these, I have pictures, but more like I have pictures from the day that Bill Clinton came. So I have all these pictures of that, but I don't have pictures of the day-to-day -day tedious life in Bosnia, which was like, talk about Groundhog Day. Oh my gosh, <laughs> every day was totally the same, same uniform, same mud same everything. And mm -hmm. I just thought it was boring. And now I really wish I had taken more pictures of just the, like, just those mm -hmm. boring things. And at the end of the table, they would put Velcro and the enlisted soldiers would put up their M16s on there and you'd tie it back with the Velcro, Velcro, because otherwise you'd have like these massive guns, like spinning around on the floor. And I mean, when I left Bosnia, I, I came back and I was like, Oh gosh, it's so weird to be like even at McDonald's that there was no Velcro on the end of that row to have some scenes there. And but I never took a picture of that because that was just that's just the way life was. So I think that's sometimes is taking yourself out of it and realizing that not everyone else lives this way and not everyone else has seen this and and or or things will change and then someday you will this picture will be valuable to you. So oh, right. sometimes I feel like we discount our stories as not being special because they're not special to us at the time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mary, Makes you sense. look like you are. I, I was thing. just thinking, even aside from my own stories, I, 
I think that sometimes exploring like the larger extended family story can really help shed light on what's going on in your life. Um, I, I try to address this somewhat in, in my novel with the generations and um, the grandmother in my novel makes a huge mistake that has consequences that are reverberating, you know, 60 years later. And I think I think that's a real thing. And I think mm -hmm. you see that especially with parenting, like how mm -hmm. I parent is a re direct result either for or against how my parents parented, which mm -hmm. is a direct result of, and it goes back and back and back. And so I think sometimes trying to understand what happened in generations past and why people and how people responded to those things can be really helpful for understanding why you're doing what you're doing. Absolutely. It's very I true. Said, I love that you said that. And I love Libby that you're talking about all these details because Mary, I mean, you're speaking to this moment where we need to kind of capture these intergenerational stories. And right now, so many of us are kind of trapped at home. Mm -hmm. So many of us are in this moment mm -hmm. where maybe we aren't seeing our family members as much as we want to be seeing our family members. And this is a great time for capturing those stories and Libby, this is a great moment for thinking about those details that the historians aren't going to capture. Mm -hmm. That presidents visiting soldiers, they're not going to capture that Velcro on the table. Right, right. And it's just so yeah. essential. This Absolutely. just made me, for some reason, a strange thought popped into my head. I made a, um, I, there's a quilt that my great great grandmother made for my great for my grandmother because they share the same birthday. And I always admired that quilt. And I remember growing up thinking, oh, I wish that we had an aunt in the family that made quilts and that there'd be quilts on all the beds. And, you know, I was just charmed by it. And when I would go antiquing and stuff, I always loved the history. I have a textile background. So the patterns are they, and when the prints came out and the, and everything else. And so I just kind of loved the whole tradition of quilts. And one day I realized I could be that great great aunt mm -hmm. someday i could make, learn to mm -hmm. hand make quilts and make quilts and then have something to pass down and put that magic into future generations and so what i did was when i purchased the fabric for my wedding quilt um i purchased a little extra and when i finished the wedding quilt i had my married name and my name and my husband's name and the date of our wedding, because I thought someday there might be somebody trying to figure out a family tree and that this has gone down to the great granddaughter and I'm no longer there. And where did this quilt come from? And then they at least know this was a wedding quilt because it has a wedding date on the back. And I included my maiden name, which I legally changed my name. My maiden name is my middle name. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, that will be a clue someday if somebody's telling the story, they'll at least know where my family tree went because I took my husband's name when I got married. Married. Um, and then every single quilt that I've made since then, I always incorporate, whether it matches or not, a piece of fabric that's from the wedding quilt. So that if there was a series of quilts handed down to through the generations, there would be that one kind of green fabric that made no sense in this pink quilt or whatever color quilt and why is that strange um, fabric there a quilt historian would know that that was a signature and so a quilt oh. historian would know that that connects this quilt to another quilt so you have to find the quilt in your family that is their origin story through quilts and so all the quilts that I'll, I'll ever make in my life will always incorporate pieces from my wedding quilt and you could almost tell the story um, mm -hmm. through those um, quilts. And I do take a picture and I try to document who I was making the quilt for. And I take a picture of the fabrics and before and after. I take, make sure that somebody takes a picture of me as I'm making it because I've been doing this now for 20 or 25 years or how, however long I've been married. I have to do the math. Um, but I haven't officially done this yet, but I thought I've done, I've correct, I've collected the information, but I haven't put it into a scrapbook, but I should tell the story through the quilts so that future generations will come to understand um, how this all came about. Trace through that fabric signature, all of the quilts back to the original. Mm -hmm. Kind of a storytelling through fabric, I guess. Mm-hmm. That's absolutely exactly. awesome. And I love the ownership that you're taking of that too, that you wish that somebody did this and wait, I can be that person. And it's the same thing with capturing those family stories, those family traditions, yeah. whatever they happen to be. 
Oh, that's wonderful. I'm seeing a couple Funny more enough, comments my... popping up. Here. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, wow. well, thank you, David. Another one talking about the story. Oh, I see. That's, that's a very good point. Began as an oral story. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, oh, also. thank you, Grace. Right. Did you have a comment, Mary? Because I was going to say something, but I didn't want to interrupt you. I was just thinking of something that Libby was talking about with capturing like those everyday moments. And a few years, I guess it was like the year before my grandmother passed away, we could, you know, we, we kind of knew our time was coming and we always go to the beach together every summer. And she couldn't even go down on the beach, like going up and down the stairs to the beach cottage was like a once a week kind of thing, you know? Wow. Um, and in fact, that might have even been a year that my husband had to carry her up the stairs. I, I don't remember, but, um, but so she was kind of stuck in the beach cottage and we kind of wanted her to still feel like it was fun. And we, so I asked if I could spend a half an hour with her every day and just take notes on her life and her childhood and things like that, because as, I guess as Libby was saying, like we'd heard the big stories, right? Like the things that were super impactful and important. Like, of course, people had told us those stories, mm -hmm. but like the little random kid hijinks and stuff, mm -hmm. like, those just don't naturally necessarily come up in conversation. And so we did that. And I, and I didn't have your family story workbook back then, <laughs> which I wouldn't have used if I had, but um, <laughs> 10 years ago or more than that, really. Um, and you know, I just sat there and took notes on my computer while she told stories and asked her questions and stuff. But she told me some of the craziest stories that were just like one time there was some kid who was like a total bully and they, he used to like, they used to go to the outhouse to go to the bathroom and then he would go out there and like push the outhouse over while they were in there. And that's how <laughs> kids. And this was like a real thing that happened that never would have come up in normal conversation, but I was fascinated by <laughs> stories like this that she yeah. would tell. <laughs> it's absolutely true because people do tell the big ones. Like I know all the World War II stories from my family history. I know the immigration to the state stories, but I don't know those little ones. And those are so valuable. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. And Melissa, you said you wanted to say something. Yeah, I was just going to say most people, especially the elderly, want the chance mm -hmm. to tell their stories. And we have to be smart enough and in the moment enough to ask to ask the questions that will allow them to share their experiences because you don't know when you're gonna run out of time. Right. Yeah. I'm so glad that I took the time to ask my grandmother um, a lot of questions. I would actually interview her. We would drink coffee and I would pull out my notebook. I would ask her, what was your first job? First job you ever had, what was it like? And ask her all of these questions. She, We would get off on a tangent, but that's fine. That's the joy of stories, right? And she started mm -hmm. talking about something else and I would incorporate them into a chicken soup story. And then she would mm -hmm. be elated because she was famous, she said, <laughs> and she was in the newspaper. But all of that, like the silliness is really just to illustrate that when they die, their stories do too, unless we have taken the time mm -hmm. to tell them ourselves. And mm -hmm. it's so important, so important. Yeah. To, to piggyback on what Melissa is saying, Chris, I've, I've purchased your the family story work. Well, I've purchased everything you've written, but um, more recently, the family story workbook. Um, and I just kept thinking, gosh, I, I know you can do it now through Zoom and we want to keep people in assisted living facilities safe during COVID. But I kept imagining like, it would be a phenomenal um, philanthropy for somebody to take on, to take your book into assisted living, whether it's your parent or not, but you could as a, as a, as just giving of yourself, go in and I can even imagine a little collection of these books with the person's name mm -hmm. on it. Grab the book and sit with them for a little while, talk to them about their life, record some things. And I just think it would be, you know, for anybody that's looking, searching for to do something really meaningful in their lives. And like I said, right now we can't, we want to keep them safe. And I'm sure that you could contact somebody within the within the facility and arrange Zoom and, and do it that way. But your book could bring, a, um, could be a, 
somebody could pick up your book and working just holding that and a pen and just walk in with somebody that they've never met and give an incredible gift to someone else and to their family and just probably hear some really wild stories. I think it would be a, a really um, enriching way to, um, you know, give of yourself in your local community. It's, really it's, all, right it's all right there. High school students could do it. It mm -hmm. could be community service. Right. And then they could write creative pieces based upon yes. the interviews that they have. I love it. They could start in the fall and for the whole year, yeah. each student with one book follows one resident. Right. And all of the okay. assignments come off of that. My, that would be amazing. My, grandma, I have a grand, my other grandmother, not the one I was talking about earlier, but the one who, she's 99 and... um she's still alive and doing really well but stuck in quarantine essentially um but william and mary has done just that they've partnered their students with people at her um her retirement community and so this will be married kid calls my grandmother every sunday um and they just had on the phone for like an hour and my mm. grandmother said that she spends all week thinking up which story to tell her this oh week. that's awesome yeah. and I thought, what a great gift that this child you know this yeah. young lady is giving to my my grandmother just that's to be scary. able to have that excitement to talk to someone new um and the girl my grandmother has traveled the world she's been to all seven continents she likes to say um and this this young lady is from India. And so I think that's pretty cool too, because she has like this different international background and my grandmother's sort of fascinated by her stories as well. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. What a great program. Yeah. That is awesome. So much well, love just, to William and Mary. I went there. Woo <laughs> 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 so mama. I was down at Hopewell. I was dropping off some books at Western Plantation and I met this man who was a military you know, a military vet. And um, he was telling me at the VFW Hall down there, they have nine members who fought in World War II. You know, they're in their like mid to late nineties. And like, I was thinking I should get my son down there to do one of these interviews with them mm -hmm. for put in the Library of Congress. But it's like, they have nine of them. And, you know, I'm sure they'd love wow. to tell their stories to people. Yeah, and right. otherwise we're gonna lose them. Absolutely. Yeah. And, it's, it's interesting and you guys are giving me ideas here. Um, this, so you all know this is my concept of the Story Stop Tour. And when my book, um, this is my third book launched in November of last year. So November of 2020, um, my Story Stops launched um, in partnership with indie bookstores around the country. And it's around the country virtually, I should say. So I've done kind of virtual events where I've virtually been in Austin, Texas and Philadelphia and Atlanta and of course Richmond and I've been jumping around the country. I'm in New Mexico next, New Mexico in quotation marks in New <laughs> next week. So I've been hopping around because one of my biggest beliefs for this storytelling project of who believes in the power of story more than independent booksellers. Mm -hmm. And so that's one big piece of this project is partnering not only with amazingly talented authors such as yourself to tell their life stories and moments of inspiration in their family history, but also with the indie bookstores that are the heart of our literary communities. Um, and it's funny that you're saying as you are, because I have kind of the multi prong piece of the story stop tour and we're a couple of months in now and we're starting to evolve a little bit where I actually do have some new partnerships with some historical societies and I have started reaching out a little bit to retirement communities. Mm -hmm. It's funny to hear you guys kind of echoing these same sentiments because everyone has stories. Mm -hmm. as we've been saying. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys are absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, as we're starting to wrap up here, I am curious, um, going back to that note of the Story Stop Tour, kind of having its origins and passion for independent bookstores. I was wondering if you could speak just for a moment on who do you want to give a shout out to? Who is an independent bookstore that you think more readers should know about, buy from, support? Um, Mary, we'll start with you. Um, I, I guess I would say Chop Suey has been um, amazing. Um, he, they did a curbside book signing for me, which is the only in real life event I got to have this fall. So <laughs> I'm certainly grateful to Ward and his crew. Um, their Instagram feed is 
totally delightful. They have tons of pictures of the resident cat, <laughs> Swan <Tons. laughs> yeah. so you can check that out. Um, but it's a really neat, if you happen to be in the area and it is open, which it was open last I heard by appointment only, I'm not sure if that's still the case, but um, it's several rooms, it's got an upstairs, this kind of funky, cool vibe in Cary Town. Um, so shout out to Chop Suey. It's a great place. Anyone want to add any others? Well, my, my favorite is uh, very close to my heart uh, is the little bookshop in Midlothian. Uh, Mary's wonderful and she loves stories and she's very hospitable and spends a lot of time helping you find the right book and um, very warm. So she's got a great following, but we are blessed to have so many good bookstores around here. That is absolutely true. That is absolutely true. Let's see. And um, uh, book people too. Mary, I know you've worked with them. That's a phenomenal place. And I, I just went there for the first time last week and I thought, what in the world have I been doing? And why have I not been here? It's an adorable place. Yeah, they have a nice um, used bookstore. Used yes, bookstore. yeah. Yeah, yeah wow. it's great, great bookshop. Collection. I definitely want to go back. And Julie, I believe you have a, a good indie bookstore story. Yeah, so um, I will shout out to the local libraries as well, um, because it's just a wonderful anytime you're surrounded by books. There's a um, indie bookstore in Paris that some people might be aware of, and it's called Shakespeare and Company, and it's been there for decades and decades. Um, the original owner, George, has since passed, and his daughter has taken over, but when I was young, back at thousand years ago, I was a trend forecaster and I used to travel the world giving presentations and conducting research. And I used to go to Europe, you know, every three weeks, every four or five weeks. And so I was there a lot. Um, and I'd always fly into Paris and fly out of Paris. And so it kind of became my neighborhood because I would be there like on the weekends when I didn't have to work. And so like local things and local coffee shops and stuff kind of became my residence, I guess, while I was over there. And Shakespeare and Company was a wonderful bookstore. And at the time, and I don't know if they still do it because um, I'm just not sure if they still do it. But at the time you could um, be a writer in residence there and you could live at the bookstore, this old indie bookstore across from Notre Dame, right in the center of Paris. Mm -hmm. And at, and they had cots, um, you know, bookshelf, books, bookshelves and cots and they'd have books stacked on the cots. And then at night when the bookstore closed, all of the books would go underneath the cots and writers would sleep on the cots and you, you could stay there for free at the time, um, provided you either um, worked that day in the bookstore, you know, shelving books or helping customers or running the cash register, or if you read a book a day. So you could either read an entire book in a day or you could clock hours. Yeah, the place was amazing. I mean, it was wow. down, there was a leak in the roof, there was all kinds of, and it was, it, it was an amazing place because very incredible people would stop by when they were in town. So you could go all the way up into this room up at the top and you never knew who was gonna drop in. Some famous Russian poet guy came one day. <laughs> I don't even know who he was, but he was apparently amazing and I should have known who he was and stuff. And I got to listen to him talk one night. It was just a wonderful place. And um, yeah, so just the vibe of being in a place that is surrounded by books and stories just is always good. I mean, I can't even imagine somebody walking into an indie bookstore and not feeling like that they, they could live there. And I almost did it. But at the time, I was desperately in love with somebody back in the States. And I felt that if I moved to Paris and lived in the bookstore to work on my first novel, that, pro that I wasn't sure what would happen with that person I was desperately in love with back in the States. And I um, will say that the, there's a happy ending because I ended up marrying him. And and, and um, he's my college sweetheart and my husband and father to our children. Our story continues, but there was a crossroads in my life where I, I made a difficult decision. I think I made the correct decision, but an indie bookseller was at the heart of that fork in the road for me. Mm -hmm. And so I always have to give a shout out to a very special place in my heart. Yeah, Shakespeare and Company. That's yeah. awesome. I feel like I have almost a opposite but still happy ending story that writing was a big piece of kind of my love story of my life in that when my husband proposed and I had said yes for the record but I felt like before we got married I needed to run away and have some me time first mm -hmm. so yeah. I ended up going to Florence Italy 
and taking a writing workshop through, I think, Julie, I think I knew you at the time. Um, I took a writing workshop through the University of Iowa in Florence, Italy, and I lived in this oh, hostel. Geez. And it was like this, I have to do this for me. And then, then I could get married, but I had to do that first. And just, yeah, it was a couple of weeks, but it was just one of those life changing moments that I'm, again, so happy I journaled through those weeks because yeah. Crazy things happen in Europe. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's true. <laughs> right? Right? Yeah. Well, anyway, again, I just wanted to thank the four of y'all so much for giving up your evening, snowy evening, rainy evening, icy evening, whatever it happens. I'm not sure work. what's going on out there. It's going to be and a mess, probably. <laughs> well, thank, thank you, Chris. This was so much fun. And I love your project. Thank it's you. Just, yeah. And it's. I think it's so transferable to, you know, as, as you know, Julie was saying of you know retirement homes, historical societies, kids, you know, and my son even when he was in first grade, they had grandparents day and they the kids had to interview their grandparents and ask them all these questions about their childhood and a lot of things I didn't know. So I think you're on yeah. something big. And Thank Chris, I want to revise your statement. You said to thank us for giving up our night, but I don't feel like I gave up anything. I feel like you added to it. So definitely. Well, thank you all. And again, for those watching, Family Story Workbook is available, especially in those indie bookshops, but wherever mm -hmm. books are sold. And it is split up into sections from your ancestry, asking those questions about as far back as you can go in your family line, all the way to your parents, a big old section on your own story and all of the subtleties that you probably have not thought about, about your own life in years, questions about where were you when the Challenger exploded. 9-11, you got your first email address, mm -hmm. all of these questions. Mm -hmm. And then the last section in here is on kind of bigger philosophical ideas, if you will. If you had to def define the word family, what does that mean to you? If you wanted to find the word success, a good life, what does that mean to you? And again, to record that, to pass it on to your kids, your grandkids, to the historians of the future, or just to kind of stick under your own pillow and take some time to ponder your own life. It's a fun project. I've been just blessed to be able to have so many wonderful conversations with folks. All right, well, I think that's it for us. Again, thank you everyone for joining us. Any final words? Congratulations, Chris. You've yes. given a, you've given a gift to the storytelling community. You know this would be a good um, a bridal gift for the bride and groom to That's get to a great idea. That's a as great form idea. As new families, um, it's wonderful for you know a baby gift that you know a baby gift exactly. Back. I was just thinking. Yeah. That. I mean, it's I, everybody should buy a stack, and whenever you need a gift to give yeah. to somebody, you could give them this because everybody everybody would benefit from having this. The whole yes. world and should have a copy. Use them. <laughs> and use them. Don't let them sit. Yes. Use them. Ask questions. You never know when it's your last chance to ask someone about their lives. Well, like in Mary's idea, or you know, with your grandmother of the Sunday phone call of doing that of like one hour a week that the you know you work on a a small section of it, and that just becomes like a your Sunday tradition. I think would be neat. Yeah. I have an idea. This would be so much fun. Similar to where a, to to the way a book club um, runs. Get a group of friends. Everybody get a copy. M when the lights turn back on, meet with wine and cheese, and you each have your own family story workbook. And you you know that this week we're going through these pages, and you work on them. And then you meet, you drink wine, you share the stories, and you know the togetherness. And then slowly but surely over the course of X number of meetings, 12 meetings, you'll have the whole workbook complete. And I think it would be an incredible experience for everybody invited. That's, That's a great idea. Fun, oh, yeah. Can you start at your house? Your yes. house? I definitely okay. I want to do that. And we don't have to wait till the, everything turns back on because you can okay. do this over Zoom. I'm in. Are you, you going to move, the pink, pink, you you move the pink cans out of your driveway? <laughs> Even with the pink cans, yes. <laughs> Oh, all the catastrophes of life and all the messiness go right inside the family story workbook for sure. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I have a rolling car story too. <laughs> and speaking of great stories for those watching, check out these amazing authors works too. They are amazing and talented and inspiring and funny and fascinating and just wonderful. So check out their stuff too. 
Thank, thank you, you everybody. Chris. Thank, thank you, Chris. Bye. So much fun. Bye. 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 Everyone has stories. Every family has stories. We just don't always record them. But imagine the history preserved. How special that would be if we actually did. Often people say they're going to write their life story, their family history, but they don't actually do it. The Family Story Workbook is a resource, a pathway to actually make it happen.